Hey friends, welcome back to the One Year Bible Journey, especially for beginners. I'm Pastor Kerry. This is Growing in the Gospel. And today we're talking about our New Testament reading for week 11. Welcome to week 11. We are making great progress. You are in the middle of the book of Luke in the New Testament. So uh, the reading for this week is Numbers 31 to Deuteronomy 9. That's the Old Testament. Luke 7 through 11, New Testament, and Psalms 33 through 35. So in this video, we're going to focus on talking through Luke 7 through 11. And in a separate video, I'm going to talk really about the whole ministry of Jesus, trying to synchronize all the Gospels that we're reading, and geographically and chronologically. So be looking for that video. But you're going to pick up the reading today in chapter 7. Jesus is still ministering primarily in Galilee, which is the northern part of Israel, and especially in the city of Capernaum. So the first story, the opening story today, is a Roman officer that comes to Jesus and expresses faith. And it's ironic because this man is expressing faith in the Jewish Messiah, and he's supposed to hate Jews. So... Jesus is showing a transcendent reality to the gospel, that it transcends racial borders and ethnic borders and boundaries and political borders and boundaries. And he uses this Roman officer as an example of someone who has real faith in the face of people who don't have faith. That's that's the irony here, is that these throngs and crowds of people that are coming to Jesus because they want free food and free healing They really don't believe who he is yet, many and most of them. And so we read this this second time in the Gospels where Jesus marveled. He marveled first at the unbelief of the people of Nazareth, his hometown. When he would do many mighty works, he couldn't because they wouldn't believe. And now this unlikely Roman centurion is is, is having real faith in Jesus as the God man. It's astounding. And Jesus marvels at his faith. Later in the chapter, Jesus is going to raise the son of a widow who lives in a small village of Nain. And then he is going to respond to John the Baptist, uh, who is in prison, about to be beheaded, and he's discouraged. You're going to read in this moment of John kind of hitting John the Baptist, hitting a low point. And this story always encourages me because in my low points, I feel like I'm not alone. Um, And Jesus tells John, sends a message back to John. I love how he receives the questions of John's disciples. And he tells John, here's the good things that are happening. He quotes Old Testament, the fulfillment of the Old Testament in the Messiah. And then he says these words, blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. What is that statement? He's saying, John, don't be offended in the will of God for your life. And that message always goes deep with me. Unless you're living your best imagination of life, it can go deep with you too. That we're all walking through the, the script of God and we're, we're, we're following his unfolding will and He will do whatever he chooses to do with our lives, and it's ours to follow, not to question, not to doubt, not to be offended at him. The chapter ends with Jesus eating with a Pharisee, and a sinful woman anoints his feet. And the Pharisee is judgmental, you'll read it, and Jesus tells a story relating, relating this principle that when our sense of forgiveness is huge, our sense of love will be equally huge. This ties in with what we studied or what we're studying this week in Deuteronomy, that our obedience to God, our sacrifices, our worship, our love to him should be driven by his love for us. And that the way our hearts change is by not trying harder to keep God's laws, but by understanding more the vastness and the lavishness of his grace and mercy and his love for us, because his love is a compelling, it's a constraining, it's a motivating kind of love. The Christian life, the journey of following Jesus is to be one that is motivated by love. 
Well, what motivates love? How do you love God more? Well, if you try to love God more, it's not going to work because you've turned loving into, into a law, okay? And, and it is, in the sense, it is a law, but, but real love flows naturally. It is motivated by love. And in the case of Scripture, in the case of God, he's made the first move. He has demonstrated eternal, infinite, lavish love for you and for me. And so the way we love him back is by understanding more his love for us. So if you said to me, Pastor Kerry, I want to love God more. How do I love him more? Look at the cross. Um, Looking unto Jesus, the author, for consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners. Consider what Jesus has done for you. Consider, this is why Jesus instituted the Lord's table, that we would remember the, the struggle of our lives, like ancient Israel in the Exodus and coming into the promised land, was forgetting. They forgot the goodness of God. And they would forget it like day to day. And that's how we are. We come into tomorrow's challenges. We forget yesterday's blessings. We forget yesterday's goodness. We forget yesterday's love. So the way to love God more is to remember and to consider how much he loves you. And the more you understand the love of God, the more you will love him. And you will want to serve him. You will want to obey him. You will want to worship him. And it will all be motivated by love. I've said it before on the video. I say it often to our church family. If I can't get there by loving Jesus, I don't want to get there any other way. If we can't get there as a church by loving Jesus, we don't want to get there any other way. We want the love of Christ to be our great motivating driving force in our individual and in our corporate lives. You come to chapter 8. You're going to read something interesting in the beginning of chapter 8. It's about women who followed Jesus. And not only did they follow him, they sustained his ministry. In fact, one of them, I I always get a laugh at this, Joanna, one of the women following Jesus, her name was Joanna, she was the wife of Herod's chief financial officer. (laughs) And she was giving of her substance to sustain the ministry of Jesus. So if you ever wonder... You know, how did Jesus pay his bills? Well, here you go. People gave. And not only did people give, these ladies gave. And not only did ladies give, the wife of Herod's CFO. You know what that means? (laughs) Money from Herod's household was coming to support the ministry of Jesus. I just love, love, love that. You're going to read again the parable of the four soils and instructions about letting our light shine. You're going to read uh, about Jesus' family showing up and, and uh, wanting to talk to him, but Jesus saying, those who believe are my family. And then Jesus gets into a ship and crosses again to the, to the region of the Gadarenes, the region of Decapolis. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, and he sets that demoniac free, and that man goes and publishes what Jesus did for him. Such a great story of the spreading of the gospel into a Gentile region Uh, that Jesus came for and to first the the Jewish people, but he still reached out. He still sent the message to Decapolis and up to Tyre and Sidon and uh, into Samaria. And uh, and, and as the book of Acts continues, we're going to see the message of the gospel go around the world. Jesus then returns to Capernaum and he's met by Jairus, the ruler of the synagogue in Capernaum, and Jairus' daughter is sick. At that very moment, a woman touches the hem of Jesus' garment, which is interesting because uh, we read in our Old Testament reading not long ago about them sewing blue ribbon on the borders of their garment, which would designate that they were followers and worshipers of God and seeking to obey and keep his laws. It was an outward sign. So Jesus would have had that blue border, that fringe on his garment, And this woman is reaching out to touch that. Why is that? What does that mean? It's symbolic. And Jesus is going to feel that touch, which is interesting because there's a throng of people. Lots of people are touching him. But this was a different touch. This was a special kind of touch. Jesus says, I felt virtue go out of me. I felt healing power leave me, which I don't totally understand all about that. That's a little bit mysterious, but it's kind of cool. And then Jesus stops and wants to know who touched him. And immediately he looks and sees her and he says, this is what he says to her, your faith made you whole. 
So here's what we can stitch together from this account, that this woman in reaching out to touch the garment of Jesus, it was an expression that she knew she did not have what it takes to save herself, to keep God's laws. She knew she had failed God's laws, but she knew that Jesus was perfect and pure as the Messiah, as the God-man, and so she wanted his righteousness. By grabbing the tassels and the ribbon on the borders of his garment, she's saying, I want his righteousness to bless me, to save me, to heal me. Beautiful picture of the gospel, that Jesus' righteousness has to be transferred to me for me to be saved. And it can be the moment I trust him in faith. Isn't that wonderful? So even while he's speaking to this woman, news comes that Jairus' daughter has passed. Jesus says, don't be afraid. And he goes and he raises her from the dead. So two death resurrections coming in this week's reading. And it's pretty awesome. And both times Jesus basically tells people, don't tell, don't, don't, don't spread this news, which I always find that interesting. What's that about? You would think that he wants the message. Well, the message of Jesus is traveling already. There's already a life to it. He wants the message to be about the gospel, not just about the signs. He's, he's giving the signs because he's good and loving and gracious and merciful. But the, the greater message is believe because there are people that are seeing the signs and still not believing. And he knows that the signs aren't really going to convince anybody. It's the, it's the call to repentance, repentance and the call to belief. And so and the people, the more they see the power, the more they see the miracles, the unbelieving crowds are trying to rush the timeline of the kingdom, Jesus becoming president. And, you know, everyone's going to, you know, free health care, free gas, free electricity, free, everything's free. We want you to be the president. It's, they want to rush the timeline. So whenever Jesus is telling somebody don't say anything or forbidding the demons to speak, it's all about the spiritual battle of redemption it's all about the timeline of God, that Jesus is coming in the fullness of time, that it's a very precise appointment he has on the cross, the resurrection. All this is specifically timed out in the will and the plan and the mysterious redemptive purposes of God. Pretty awesome. So chapter 9, Jesus then sends out the 12 to preach the gospel, and he gives them very specific instructions to their moment. Not all of these instructions carry forward to all gospel ministry of all time. Uh, and that's the same with the ministry of the 70 that we're going to see in chapter 10. Herod kills John the Baptist uh, and is confused about Jesus. The disciples return and they're very happy. They're very excited. They say, even the demons are subject to us. And Jesus says, don't, don't. Well, actually, I'm ahead of myself. That's in the sending out of the 70. The 12 come back and Jesus takes them across the lake, the Sea of Galilee, to Bethsaida. And we read again of the feeding of the 5,000. So not long after this, Jesus takes his disciples north, and he has this conversation about who do men say that I am. They're in Caesarea Philippi, and Peter confesses, you are the Christ. At this point, Jesus begins, he's going to wind down his Galilean ministry. He begins to, again, as we've seen in other gospels, teach about his death, which the disciples don't understand, don't even want to understand. And Jesus again comes to that critical teaching about losing our lives to him, losing our inner sense of self, our self-definition. And we've talked about that in previous videos. Eight days later is the Mount of Transfiguration. And Luke's account of the Mount of Transfiguration is really, really amazing. This is an epic moment of revelation. It's an epic moment of spiritual conflict. Jesus' true glory is revealed as he's communing at the top of Mount Hermon with Moses and Elijah. And you're going to read this week something really interesting. Not only is his countenance all altered and his clothing is white, basically the Jesus of Revelation shows up in, uh, in reality on the top of Mount Hermon. And it's interesting that uh, Peter, James, and John are asleep during the beginning of this event, which is funny. But Jesus is meeting with Moses and Elijah in this moment of brilliance, and they're talking. They're having a conversation about his crucifixion, which wouldn't you like to hear that conversation? Maybe someday we'll be able to. Well, the disciples wake up. They're freaked out in watching and witnessing this event, and then they want to stay. They want to build tents and stay, 
and, and enter into these conversations with Moses and Elijah. But then while they're suggesting this, a cloud envelops them. The voice of God says, this is my son. Listen to him. It freaks them out, scares them to death. And, and then Luke says, they didn't tell anybody about this situation. I want you to know this is the moment that Jesus is referring to when he says, there be some sitting here that will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of God that they get to see. It's a foreshadowing. It's a, it's a revelation of what it will happen someday, what we read about in the real book of Revelation. And so they come down. Uh, there's an interaction over a demon-possessed boy that you're going to read about. The disciples are continuing now to argue as they're journeying. They're arguing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom. They still aren't getting it. And Jesus is refuting this teaching by teaching them to be servant-hearted. I want to point something very important out, and this is critical. And you might want to kind of circle this verse or highlight or make, make note. Luke 9.51 is a turning point in the book of Luke. It's like a hinge. From this point forward, Jesus is leaving Galilee and going to Jerusalem for his crucifixion. The timeline is set. There's an appointment. There's a crucifixion on the timeline. He has one more campaign, gospel campaign, through the hills, the hill country of Judea. So this is south of Galilee, coming through Samaria, coming along the Jordan River Valley to the west, and then coming up into the hills and into Jerusalem. And he's going to preach the gospel to these regions one more time. And he's going to send out his 70 uh, followers in teams to do the same thing in Judea. This is interesting. Basically, what they've done two or three times in Galilee, twice with Jesus and once the 12 being sent out, they're going to do again in Judea. And what I want you to see about this is that this entire region were given the gospel more than once. Over and over and over, Jesus has pleaded with the people to believe. And the disciples have pleaded with them to believe, to place their faith, their saving faith in uh, the grace and the mercy of Jesus. So verse 51 says, and it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. So now it's time. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. So Jesus is on a mission. Every step, every interaction, every appointment is deliberate. At this point, he passes south through Samaria. They don't receive him because he's focused on getting to Jerusalem. Uh, and there may be some, some prepackaged racial tension there on the part of the Samaritans. The disciples want to kill them. Jesus rebukes them and says, hey, I came to save men, not destroy them, which is a great encounter. So from this point forward, um, verse 57 and forward, a man wants to follow Jesus, but he wants to follow him on his own terms. And he, and he wants to delay the process. You need to know this. These interactions that it seems like Jesus is demanding or Jesus is like quickly drawing a line in the sand. Like this man wants to go bury uh, the dead. He wants to go bury his, his father. And Jesus says, follow me now. Well, you need to know that in Jewish culture, the burial process was a year. And we don't even know if this man's uh, uh, de dad was sick or near death. So what he's saying is someday. Someday I want to follow you. But Jesus has now only months of ministry left. And that's why Jesus says, let the dead bury their dead. Come follow me. Choose your priorities. He's not simply saying, don't uh, uh, fulfill your responsibilities to your family. No, other parts of scripture, we're instructed to fulfill our responsibilities to family. No, what he's saying is he's calling out people for their flimsy and false excuses and for their secondary motivation. He's calling them out. He's calling out their true motives is what he's doing. And I want to just comment on this, that the, the conversations of Jesus are always, he knows the hearts of men. He knows their motives. And so what seems obscure or detached or disconnected to us, and we don't get, what you need to be thinking about is he knows the heart of that person. And the way he's speaking to that person is aiming right at their heart. We've seen that all through Matthew and Mark, and now we see it again in Luke. But we do see that the call to follow at the end of chapter 9 is a wholehearted call, not a half-hearted thing, uh, and we can't postpone followership. It's right now. It's today. Jesus wants all of me right now, 
and he's worthy of that. Chapter 10 is the Judean ministry, the ministry of Jesus throughout Judea. Judea is the hill country all around the city of Jerusalem. So he sends out the 70 representatives in teams, gives them instructions, tells them to prepare the way everywhere that he's going to come. So they're supposed to kind of, they're the advanced team. They get everybody ready. Jesus comes and preaches the gospel. And uh, and as he goes through, he is condemning the cities that have already rejected him. Capernaum, Bethsaida, Chorazin. Afterwards, the 70 return. They're rejoicing that the devils are subject to them. And Jesus makes an interesting statement. Hey, don't rejoice that the devils are subject to you. Rejoice, rather, that your names are written in heaven. What's he saying? Don't rejoice in what you can do. Don't rejoice in the results or the outcomes of your ministry or your life. Don't rejoice in the material metrics. No, your greatest source of joy, your greatest source of rejoicing should be that which you can never lose because metrics come and go. <clears throat> Maybe tomorrow the dev- devils won't be subject to them. Maybe tomorrow the ministry results won't be the same. He's speaking to all of us on these terms. <clears throat> Let your deepest anchoring of your heart be embedded in the reality that you are a child of God. Your name is written in heaven. If you've received Jesus as your savior, you are secure. Salvation is yours. And then the ups and downs. On a good day, you're doing good. Your job's good. Everything's good. On a bad day, you lost your job. You lost your loved ones. Things are down. Ups and downs of life. If we tie our hearts to visible outcomes of life, we're destined to disappointment. But if we tie our hearts most deeply to our salvation, my name is written in heaven, then I have a transcendent joy. I have a transcendent durability that's going to hold me together no matter what. What a great reality. We're going to then read the parable of the Good Samaritan, which really exposes deep racial hatred, and it's Jesus turning the laws against the people that say they're keeping them. And uh, in the picture of the Good Samaritan, we are all the man that's half dead on the roadside. And Jesus is the Samaritan. And we all need the salvation that he provides. And once we've received it, he says to us, go and do likewise. And then we come to chapter 11, which is our final chapter for today. And I'll touch on this quickly and we'll be done. The disciples ask Jesus here to teach them to pray. And so we read Jesus giving what we call the Lord's Prayer to the disciples. It's Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer. And um, and then Jesus teaches them in some parables how to relate to God, especially in prayer. What I want you to know, he, he does this a couple times. <clears throat> he does this one. This one in particular is um, about importunate prayer and about, you know, wearing somebody down. He gives another story about an unjust judge and a widow. And when you read these stories, you're thinking, okay, is God just annoyed by my prayers? So he's, I'm going to wear him down and give in. But you need to understand Hebrew culture and the way Jesus is communicating. He's taking an extreme negative and contrasting that with an extreme positive. And so he says in verse 13, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more, see, how much more, that's the extreme contrast. So it's a contrast of extremities. It's not a, it's not a simile. It's not a likeness. Jesus is not saying God is like you, an imperfect parent, just getting irritated and finally giving in to their kids. No, God is not like the unjust judge finally giving in to the annoying widow. No, he's saying if even unjust people, even evil people, even wicked or sinful people will give good gifts to their children, how much more would a perfect heavenly father give to his children? And so the idea is that we get a so much bigger picture of God and his heart and his goodness. You're going to read in these chapters that massive crowds are still following Jesus. And and remember what we talked about, Who's who is in those crowds? There's always dedicated believers like the women that are funding Jesus' ministry and the disciples. There's always undecided future believers like they're close, but they're undecided. 
There's always just the gawkers, the spectacle chasers. They want to see the miracles and they want the free meals. And then there's always the enemies, the diabolical plot plotters. They're the ones that are planning his execution, his assassination. And so um, Jesus is still surrounded by all these people. So he's still preaching the gospel. He's still doing healings and delivering works. And he's still calling people to belief and he's still exposing uh, the religious leaders. We end chapter 11 with instructions about living in the light and then the public condemnation of religious leaders who are pretending to be light but are actually darkness. Jesus is calling out oppression and perversion in religious structure and that's why the leaders hate him all the more. And by the end of chapter 11, they really want Jesus dead And this situation is boiling up. It's boiling up and it's going to reach a boiling point in uh, in weeks or months as Jesus arrives in Jerusalem for the Passover. At such time, he's going to be crucified. So this is our reading up to Luke 11 for week 11 in the New Testament. I wish you Godspeed in your reading this week. I hope that you will continue to fall in love with Jesus. I hope that you will share your comments or questions uh, and share what you're learning and how God is working in your life. And I congratulate you on finishing week 11 in the one-year Bible journey. We have 52 weeks. We are 11 weeks in. So we have 41 weeks left. And I hope you'll stick with me all the way through. Hey, have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow.